You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited. Uh, This is an interview that I've been waiting to do for a couple of weeks now. One of my favorite writers on the planet, Jilly McMillan, joins me again today. She's been on the show a couple of times before. I'll put links in the show notes where you can catch up on these previous chats that we've had. But Jilly uh, has a new book. It's called To Tell You the Truth. And I was just telling her before we started recording that when this book came uh, I, I read the the inside flap of of the jacket, and I knew that this was one of those um, th- this is one of those concepts that that I think writers look forward um, to because it's it's kind of inside baseball, um, but in in the best way possible. Um, and I, I'm purposefully not saying what the book is about yet because we're going to get into it in a minute. Uh, welcome back to the show, Jilly. Oh, thanks for having me again, Hank. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's it's so much fun to to get to catch up with you um, every year, as as is our tradition now. Um, so, to tell you the truth, this new book, Jilly, um, this this is uh, we just love books about writers. Um, there's something so fun about writers getting to read a book about writers and you kind of, there's a smile that comes on your face because you, you understand some of the struggles. Um, did, did have you ever read a, another book about writers that, uh, that, you know, gave you that kind of giddy feeling that you, you knew you were going to get to, uh, uh, to see some of the struggles that that you had been through, I n- not one that mirrors the struggles of writing a book a year, which is something I deal with. And to tell you the truth, but the one I loved that was about a writer was um, oh, I'm going to try to get the title right. Is it the the mystery of uh, Roger Cabrera? Do you know that one? I don't. A- I don't. I don't think so. Oh, it's terrific. And I, I've got an awful feeling I've said the, the title wrong. I'll try and look that up and correct that before the end of this. But it's great. It's about a best-selling novelist who gets drawn into a, a murder investigation and has to go and see his mentor. And it's messy. There's a book at the heart of it. And it is, you know, there is some in-house stuff, which I which I really enjoyed. That's uh, awesome. I I, I want to look that up for sure. Yeah. Um, so... The the character of Lucy Harper, um, who who we meet in this book, um, where did she where did she come from for you? Well, I was really really interested in writing a book that had an unreliable narrator at the heart of it because I love reading books like that, and I began to think who would make a good unreliable narrator and and lots of people have done it really really well if you think of the girl on the train and the alcoholic narrator in that and there are tons of other examples but i started to think well you know who spends their life kind of with one foot in reality and one foot in in fiction in unreality um obviously it's a writer and i thought well perhaps they'd make a good unreliable narrator because if a writer got overwrought or, you know, a little bit too into their fiction, maybe the lines between truth and fiction and reality and unreality might blur for them a little bit. So wouldn't that be fun to play with? (laughs) So that's what I did. (laughs) So Lucy is married uh, to another writer. And, and I think there are, uh, there are several, couples like this that I've met um, in, in the industry um, where where they're both writers. And one uh, one of the, the people in this relationship tends to have a, a more successful career, which we'll is put it, it that way. And the other person tends to get overshadowed. Um, and maybe that's in, intentional, maybe not. But it, it's just a fact uh, of life. And, and then the one person kind of takes a back seat um, as they help 
the other person's career. Um, and th- that's a really great dynamic that you've drawn uh, between Lucy and Dan, um, because Dan also fancies himself a writer and and a uh, a very serious writer. And, and and that's kind of drawn out in some other relationships that happen in the book where he he kind of feels like he's he's an important writer. Um, and yet his, all of his livelihood comes from his wife who writes very commercial fiction who, that he kind of turns his nose up to, um, yet it pays for everything that, that he enjoys in life. That's, that's such a great dynamic to play with. I enjoyed that so much. Um, you know, I'm not immune to the, uh, I mean, how to put this nicely, the way that commercial fiction like thrillers, uh, which I obviously write, is something that people can sniff at a little bit because it's not what they might want to call literary. And yet, you know, it's one of the best selling genres um, out there and a lot of people make a nice living from it. So I really wanted to, to poke a little at that dynamic. And Dan and Lucy's relationship seemed like a really interesting place to do that because in the book, she is a super best-selling author. She has made a ton of money. And as you say, Dan really, really enjoys living off that. And in fact, it buys him a little power and it kind of strokes his ego a little bit to be rich and to kind of mingle with the new wealthy neighbors in their new neighborhood. Um, And yet, and yet, even though his writing hasn't done anything to speak of, he enjoys feeling superior to Lucy because he believes that he is the better writer. So it was great fun to introduce all of those sort of hot and nasty dynamics into this marriage. So one of the other main characters who spends a a lot of time with us in the book, um, I'll I'll let you uh, tell us about her in a second, but we love to kind of jokingly talk about the fact that as writers, we spend a lot of our time uh, with people that are fictional and and they become real people. And especially when you're writing uh, a longstanding series like Lucy is, these, these characters really, um, we say that writers are the only people that, that we get to talk to the voices in our head and, and it makes perfect sense. And, and, <laughs> you know, we, we, we kind of, you know, a wink and a nod to that, but who is this other character that we meet in the book? So the other really important character is a character called Eliza and Eliza originally is my heroine's, uh, imaginary childhood friend and she is the main source of emotional support for for Lucy the writer um, throughout most of her childhood when a very traumatic event happens um, as you find out if you read the book Um, now what happens to Eliza is normally childhood imaginary friends just get left behind at some point as people grow into adulthood. But Lucy doesn't leave her behind. She turns her into the main character in her best-selling novels. So the Eliza, the childhood friends, becomes Detective um, Sergeant Eliza Gray in Lucy's best-selling novels. And so their relationship kind of intensifies um, as Lucy becomes an adult and she starts to feel constricting to her. And uh, That feeling of constriction, that sense that Eliza's overstepping her fictional boundaries is something that triggers the main action in the in the um, modern day part of the book. So we've we've kind of set the stage with with a lot of the characters that we're going to meet in the book Um, from from your perspective, Jilly, um, where did where did Lucy and 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 the other characters come from for you? And, and, you know, how long had you been thinking about this concept of, you know, a a book about a writer and, you know, a a mystery writer and then the mystery that that uh, begins to envelop her own life? Like how long had you kind of been stewing on these characters and this concept? If I'm honest, uh, not not very long. Um, I tend to finish a book and then I get into um, date what can be days and weeks of discussion with my agent about what to do next, and we'll throw ideas around. We'll we'll kind of develop them together. It's a very useful process to talk to, talk to somebody as you do that, and I kind of. I I can never quite remember the genesis of things, but I think we put out this idea of an unreliable narrator. I suggested a writer. We began to talk about 
the nature of fictional characters and how large they can loom and how much um, the pressures of writing a book um, a year, which is what Lucy does in the, what Lucy has to do in the novel, um, can it, that takes a toll. It's hard work, and so we started to talk about you know how things could go a little bit off the rails. Um, what was interesting was taking a look at my own habits, my professional life, and kind of thinking, well, how could this get really kind of twisted and sinister so at first that was fun but it did get a little bit creepy <laughs> as the book went along so it kind of all came in a rush and I and I like that because it's like a surge of energy you suddenly go yes I should be a writer yes why not make her a mystery writer then I can set up this dynamic with her husband and then when we thought of Eliza and started to discuss who she would be um, then it got really exciting because that was a whole other layer to the story I like this idea that you that you talk about this um, uh, this collaborative nature of kind of the genesis of stories that you have with your agent and th that you pitch ideas back and forth and that can be a very useful tool to um, to to really get the creative juices flowing. Um, at at what point when you're when you're thinking um, you know okay, okay now I'm on to something and I see a story thread here. Um, at, at what point do you take that and just run with it? And and how much of the story um, are, are you planning out ahead of time? And how much are you discovering as the, the book writing gets underway? So my agent and I differ here. <laughs> I don't <laughs> need a great deal to get going. I need a um, strong character or two, a kind of... Um, concept for the book and and the sense of an ending. I, I know whether I want it to be uh, really awful or a little bit resolved or this or that. I kind of need that. And then I can just start. Um, my agent in common with all editors across the globe, I believe, would like things a bit more planned, but that's not how I work. So as soon as we've got that initial stuff um, together and it's exciting and I know that it's strong we both feel that it's strong then I will um, take it off and start to work on it and I but I will make it up as I go along I I would love to be a planner but I just my brain just doesn't work that way Papyrus Author was designed and developed with the modern writer's needs wishes and preferences in mind from big structures right down to tiny details every single feature of our software has been carefully and meticulously crafted in collaboration with authors. Take charge of your writing with the author interface, which gives you access to different elements of your story, such as characters, backgrounds, and narrative structure. Move sections of your writing seamlessly in the navigator and evaluate the complexity of your text with our expert style and readability analysis. Never worry about losing progress with automated backups. With Papyrus Author, you can be your own writer, editor, and publisher. The world of writing is about to change. Papyrus Author, the word processor for authors, has arrived on the international stage. Unrivaled in its scope, it is the first software suite to unite every single step of creative writing. The vision behind Papyrus Author is to empower everyone with an idea to turn it into a great book for free. A word processing core that matured for over 10 years at its foundation, Papyrus Author goes beyond the text with its intuitive organizing layers for story, characters, notes, and research. The powerful style and readability analysis help raise manuscript quality. The inbuilt publication capabilities take the book directly to the reader with ebooks, docx, and print ready PDF. Visit papyrusauthor.com to get started today. So um, how, mu how much of the story do you need to have settled in your mind before, uh, before you can see the path ahead? Not much, almost nothing. I will literally start on the first few scenes and see what happens. I'll probably know what you might call the inciting incident. Um but but really nothing more than that because I find that it's not until I'm writing that I get that kind of pure concentration that you need to really get the good ideas flowing. And, and I know that's different from a lot of other people, but that's the process for me. And often those early words 
won't make it into the book. So often, usually the first scene I write always makes it into the book. But after that, sometimes I'm just working through stuff and that'll be cut later. So I have to edit quite heavily. But but the best thing for me to do is just get going. So we you you talk about this idea of the um, uh, the untrustworthy narrator and uh it so when you when you start thinking in those terms uh do you start thinking about the mysteries that will come up and and how to keep the reader kind of off of their um uh, off kilter a little bit um like what what does it do for you as a writer to have someone that the readers can't necessarily trust fully uh, that was hard. I, I, this book was the hardest book I've written, and I think probably for that reason, um, because I kind of have to set myself off kilter a little. And because I haven't planned in advance, sometimes I write a scene thinking, well, this could go two ways, you know, so I'm not, I don't entirely, I'm not entirely sure whether Lucy's telling us the truth or not in certain scenes, or I wasn't when I wrote them. Um, So that helped me kind of get that tone and that sense around that character, but it also made the writing of the book very hard. It always felt very unstable, this book, as if I might never be able to pull the strands together. Um, So it was a challenge, definitely. Um, But I, but what you hope from that is the, the reader's never quite sure. Gotcha. So when, um, you know, this this idea of, um, you know, can we trust, um, you know, the narrator who's telling us the story that, you know, one thing that you really need um, in, in a great protagonist is someone that people can relate to and that they can um, that they can root for in in some sort of way. And, you know, the the unrelatable, untrustworthy narrator is really a, a balancing act in making uh, her uh, you know, believable in in at least uh, a way that that we can root for her while keeping the reader almost at arm's length. Um, What are some of the challenges of of writing that character while also, you know, making her trip up the readers, if you will, as you go? That's a really good point. Um, I worked really hard with Lucy to make her relatable because she's a bit of a trope on paper, a best-selling, multi-million copy best-selling author, you know, but in reality, when you meet her, she's really insecure. Um, She has insecurities around almost everything in her life. She's clearly being somewhat badly treated by her husband. She's clearly on the back foot when she goes for meetings with publishers and her agent because they're all a bit slicker than she is. This is a woman who spends all her time in a room in a fictional world. Um, She's socially awkward um, and she's sad. You know, she has this tragedy in her childhood that's unresolved when her brother, her little brother went missing. So I think those are some of the ways that I try to make her relatable um, for readers. She had a lot of traits that I could relate to personally and I kind of hoped that that would make her somebody that felt real and not just like a sort of cipher for, for my readers. So, um, as the, as the story starts to unfold and, and we kind of get glimpses into what's going on, um, how did you balance, um, uh, you know, the, the, the character of Lucy and uh, and the other characters and, and you know, when to when to bring them in, when to allow them to to kind of play against the story. What, you know, as you, as you start, sort of saw where the story was going in your mind, um, how did you begin to lay that out? So in a first draft, I'll just do that by gut instinct, because I, I don't like to let things hold me up in a first draft. Otherwise, the whole book can end up taking far longer than it should to write. So I'll go with it. And it's in the second draft where the work really starts for me in that respect, um, because I'll, by then I'll have my I'll have input from my editors and my agent. And then I have to look at the whole package and go, right, here's what we're focusing on. This is the most important storyline. Here are the others. And I'll analyze 
if the balance is right, if the flow is right, if the the right storylines are coming in at the right time. So it's, you know, often I can rewrite whole sections of the book to kind of achieve that. So it's a two-step process. I'll start using my gut sort of writer's instinct, if you like, and then it'll get honed and honed in a second draft. Gotcha. Um, do you know how the story, what that final twist is going to be and kind of what that final reveal will be uh, when you begin writing it? Do you, are you writing toward um, that or is it just a, a kind of a series of puzzles to you? It's it's a series of puzzles at first. Um, I think as I get toward the end, you know, if you're lucky, you get this moment where you go, oh, yes, oh, yes. And by then I'm often speaking to other people about it as well. And an idea can come together. So what I like is if by the time I'm maybe two thirds of the way through, I have I know what that ending is going to be. I know what that twist is going to be. And then you can really write towards that with with some with some energy. And that's that's when it's very exciting. If it takes any longer, it's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> so you. You know, you're writing um, this this series of events that are happening, um, and it, how different is your first draft um, from, say, the the final um, the final edits that you turn in to the publisher? Um, you know, do, is is do you consider the first draft as it's kind of the way for you? To, to kind of get to the end of the story, and then you look for ways to to interject other elements into the story and the editing um or are you one of these people that writes a a, a pretty clean first draft and and figure it out and and when you get to the end of the story you know it's exactly how you wanted it to be Th- does that make sense it makes sense my f- what i hope from a first draft um it, I know it's going to be messy. I know there are going to be uh, pages and pages that are poorly written. Um, what I really want is for my characters to be absolutely there by the end of a first draft. And what the second draft normally involves for me is injecting tension or moving things around to make sure that the pacing is is there so for the thriller reader so they're not disappointed so they don't go well this could be good but it's a little bit slow so that's sometimes missing from my first draft and that's what I'll probably work hardest on um for a second draft so you know I've got my guys I know who they are I know my ending I know what's happening but I really need it to pick up the pace so that's what I'll be doing be shaving stuff off insert you know so shaving words from some sections inserting new sections reorganizing to really push that pace along as a writer who typically writes a book a year um what was the 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 most fun part of writing this book for you and and you know was there was there some elements of the industry that you got to sort of poke fun at yeah, it was fun. It was fun to write the lunch scene with the publishers. Uh, Lucy has a, has lunch with her publisher and her agents, and they're persuading her to do something that she uh, she doesn't really want to do. And uh, that was super fun because I think all industries have an element of, of that in them. Um, and it was just fun to kind of let my mind go a little bit in terms of a writer character, make her a little bit just stretching out you know, some of um, habits and, and elements of my own personality and other writers I know and kind of letting all of that mingle to create this this lovely fictional writer who's so kind of quirky and uh, and unreliable. The, there are um there are little vignettes that you include in the book um which are in the second person perspective, which is um which is very difficult to pull off if you've never tried it. And and doesn't work for a lot of stories, but in this setting, um, it really, um, you know, well, one, it, it serves, it serves to kind of put us off, off our foot in, in the beginning, um, you know, like, like what is, what's Jilly doing here and why are we shifting perspective? And then as the book goes along, it becomes more and more clear why, why this is, um, when did you choose to, to incorporate this kind of element of storytelling and and what did it do for you as the writer to include that? I had this element in right from the start. Um, 
it took a while to get it right. I was absolutely certain that it needed to be um, second person um, because I wanted it to really engage, you know, to sort of grab the reader by the by the collar, really, and say, hey, you need to pay attention to, to these sections. They're super important um, to the story and to what now unfolds. Uh, I loved writing them. I found, I, I found that once I figured out where to start in that within that story um i wrote those much more quickly than the other prose so they were a joy to write gotcha um what uh th- there are so many mysteries um in the beginning of this book and in things that we get to discover as it goes along um did you really have kind of the complexities uh of her character mapped out from the beginning or did 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 she reveal more of herself to you in the writing i i'm going to say that she came to me pretty fully formed which which doesn't always happen but but lucy really did she is such a sort of package of success and sort of you know, professional success and personal failure. And uh, she stayed like that the whole way through. And that was one of the things that made a difficult book a little bit easier is that she was there from the start and she didn't alter too much. It was always clear to me what she would do in any situation. Um, I got really fond of her, actually. Do, do you do you see her showing up in any books in the future? Never say never, Hank. <laughs> 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 oh man, I love this book so much, Jilly. Um, I, because I, I know the kind of writer that you are. Um, what are you looking forward to for next year? I am working on a book about three very different women who end up in a very remote off-grid location without their husbands um, for a weekend away. Um, The husbands were supposed to be with them. And on arrival in the location where they have no phone reception or no transport back for 24 hours, they discover a letter which tells them that something um, sinister has happened to one of their husbands. And so that's where I am. I'm in that place in a remote location with those women right now, figuring out their story. It's really, really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this the the sixth um, novel that you've had that, out? Uh, to tell you the truth is my sixth, sixth novel, yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, after writing six of these, does it get easier as it goes or, you know, each uh, – uh, each year when when you're beginning a new one and you're just sitting there with the blank page, um, are, you know, is it the same process over and over or having six under your belt? Does that make it easier? I think it makes it harder. I don't know why, but I I, I, I struggle. I, I love writing the beginnings. That, that's great fun because you can't you haven't you haven't messed it up yet. You haven't kind of ruined your <laughs> idea <laughs> and you're very free at the beginning to kind of go where you want to. Um I think it's a confidence thing. Every time you think, can I do it? And and every book has its own challenges and every character has his or her own challenges. So I suppose I don't make as many rookie mistakes as I used to, but I still find it, you know, incredibly difficult. It still fills my brain dawn to dusk, really. Do you do you feel like you're in competition with yourself that, uh, uh, you, you know, writers, we're really not in competition with each other. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of direct competition, but do you ever feel like that you you need to outdo yourself for what you've done in the past? I feel like I, I I want to do a book justice for for my readers. Um, I'm very focused on the product, the final product. So I think I'm always thinking as a reader because obviously before as a writer, as a reader, an obsessive reader, and I th- I always think, is this good enough? You know, I always you know. It's, it's worth remembering your readers are probably smarter than you and they can probably figure things out more quickly than you might. And so I'm, I'm thinking of that all the time. You know, am I doing this right? Am I doing this book justice? Is this going to be a good read? And that's that's the thing that keeps me going. Will it be a good read? Will people want to turn pages? That's the pressure I exert on myself. 
Love it. Um, the new book, To Tell You the Truth, is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Um, there's links to it in the show notes. Um, Jilly, um, d- can you tell us anything about the characters that, that you're working on now? Not yet. No, no. I kind of know them. They're here, <laughs> but um, I'm not talking about them yet. <laughs> Love it. Um, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. They can visit me on social media or on my website, which is Um Yeah, and I'm there for everyone to see uh, see what else I've written, and I'm always around for a chat on social media. Excellent. We'll put links to those places where they can connect with you in the show notes of this episode to make it easy for people to find you. Jilly, um, always a highlight of my year. Thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Oh, it's a highlight of my year, too. Thanks so much, Hank. Do you ever wonder if a person's critical thinking comes at the expense of their own happiness? Is it possible to be very happy and still practice excellent discernment? I used to wonder the same thing. Then I discovered the Trouble in Paradise podcast with Nigel Kent and Jasmine Starr, where they laugh as well as think about conspiracy theories and unexplained phenomena without ever getting bogged down in the age-old tug-of-war between logic and feeling. The Trouble in Paradise podcast is a joyful program for critical thinkers who have a sense of humor. Join Nigel and Jasmine as they probe the intriguing and wacky culture of odd occurrences, strange news, and ridiculous coincidences on this hilariously intelligent podcast. Trouble in Paradise on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Follow at TipCast239 on Twitter. Trouble in Paradise with Nigel Ken and Jasmine Starr, a happy podcast for critical thinkers like you.